Transformative Principle, episode 93 with Michael Shapiro. Today I'm going to continue my conversation with Michael Shapiro about Highland Tech Charter School in Anchorage School District that really focuses on personal mastery through student-centered, individualized learning and varied assessment strategies. It's all about students' abilities rather than their age, which you learned in last week's episode. And what we're going to talk about today is how to focus and teach teachers to do this. We're going to talk about the challenges they face and about how they give up control to the students. Really great interview. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for listening. Let's talk a little bit about how you teach your teachers to to teach in this manner. You've got to have a significant amount of professional development, I imagine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. It starts with content expertise and a deep understanding of the standards. Once a teacher has that, they've got a foundation for building a curriculum and implementing a curriculum that's standards-based. We also try to work with, begin with the end in mind. If you, if you're thinking of, you know, uh, understanding by design and the work of Wiggins and McTighe, we do a lot with teachers to work backwards from the learning target to the learning activity. So there's a lot that goes into planning meaningful activities that align with standards. And then there's another level of, of work that goes into helping teachers help students to revise and refine their work because in a traditional system, it's so often one and done. Really much of, you know, at least in my experience in a traditional system, you take a test, you take a quiz, you do a paper, you hand it in, you're done. You know, the, the, the one exception to that might be in language arts where you go through multiple drafts of a paper. So we work a lot with teachers on understanding what that looks like to give the right kind of feedback to a student to get them to earning the standard. So we'll do, you know, we'll look at a piece of writing and we'll all look at it and assess it to gain some inter-rate reliability. We'll talk about um, what the learning target looks like in, in practice. We talk about what does it really mean to demonstrate proficiency? If a student does something once, does that mean they've mastered it? So in many of our standards, we're looking for multiple, what we call hits in a certain learning target. So teachers need to understand the type of standards that require a level of depth of understanding before we can determine that a, that a student truly has mastered that concept. So a lot of it, I think, is intuitive. A lot of it is having teachers that are that are well trained and that are are really proficient in their craft, and then the rest of it is somewhat trial by fire, and then constant dialogue about what do you need as a teacher to support you in this model. We still enjoy a, a, a pretty robust relationship with with the Risk Coalition. We had a site visit last fall and winter where we got some feedback about where we thought we were in relation to the risk model and where we wanted to go and take our next steps. So, you know, we're we're constantly, I think we're in a state of ongoing renewal. Yeah, I, I think you have to be with the approach that you're taking at your school. What are some of the barriers that people have when they when they start at that school to, I'm talking about the teachers here, what barriers do teachers have when they start at the school um, to change their old mindset of how we do traditional education? I think probably the, the greatest barrier is time because once you get into this system, the day-to-day of it the, the teaching and learning, you, you wouldn't walk into one of our classrooms necessarily on every day and see, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. You're going to see some of that. You're going to see a much more student-centered environment, uh, less. And so I guess now that I, now that I talk through this, probably that's the, the biggest barrier for teachers is giving up a lot of the control to students because we really try to empower students to demonstrate their learning in multiple ways, in creative ways, in collaborative ways that are different from a traditional system. So I think 
it's that that giving up of, of some of the control that we're all used to as teachers in the classroom over the the learning activities on the day to day and being more responsive. Now, all teachers have to be responsive. I don't mean to denigrate anybody. All teachers have to be responsive to the individual and group needs of their students. But I think in the day-to-day life of our school, there is a need to be even much more responsive to individual needs. Every class, every day is differentiated. And, you know, what's the first thing you you learn when you learn about differentiation? Don't try to differentiate every lesson every day for every student. And I'm not saying that we have to do that, but there's a, a tremendous level of differentiation that has to go on. All of our teachers are teaching multiple levels of their content. They are also teaching, each of them is teaching an elective course. They are teaching a skills class in either math or writing. And I haven't even talked about this. They're all advisors. Every every teacher has an advisory of 14 to about 20 students. And we have a really robust advisory program where we take that that advocacy piece of advisory and academic coaching piece of advisory incredibly seriously because our students wouldn't get through our system without it. So it's having to wear all of those hats as well as be a content expert. I think that is that is a real challenge for our teachers. Yeah, I imagine that there would be many challenges with going with this approach, but I imagine also that the rewards are incredibly high for the teachers as well. Once they realize how to give up that control, how to focus on the individual needs of their students, they probably see a, a pretty big bang for their buck. Is that a good assumption to make? I think so. You know, as I said, we were a small school. Last year, we graduated 14 students, I think, 12. We graduated 12 students. Now, put that up against any other school in, in, in the city or the state, and that is a pretty small graduating class. But I would put the quality of our graduates up against anybody. I think they are ready for the world when, when they leave us, and I think there's a tremendous sense of pride on the part of our staff when, when they see those students cross that stage. Yeah, that makes sense. When I was like, I don't know, 18 or 21, somewhere around there, I saw a, a program on like 60 Minutes or something like that, that talked about doing school just like this. And I don't remember what school district that was. I do remember that it was in Alaska, and I'm pretty sure that it was the Bering Strait School District, which is where a lot of the people in risk are from and they were doing the same kind of approach. And I know that a few years ago they were just doing this all the time and from, and I I believe they're still doing the same approach, but they've shown great success over time. That's a rural school with a lot of village sites. It's about the size of Missouri or something like that. So it's a it's a small school. You're a small school. Is this something that can scale to be a, a school wide approach at, at a larger school? I mean, our school only has 450 kids, but it's definitely larger than yours, I imagine. Can this scale to bigger schools? That's a great question. I think it can, but I think you have to be very careful and, and cautious and do it one step at a time. I had the opportunity last year to go on a site visit to a school district in Michigan that had started to work with the Risk Coalition uh, the previous couple of years. And they were ready, and this was a pretty big high school. I want to say this is probably like an 1,800, maybe 1,600 student comprehensive high school. And they were ready to just jump into the deep end. And they talked about going to proficiency-based assessment. And what their plan was to say, okay, next, we've done all of this professional development. We've, we've written all our standards. We've written all, they call them learning targets. We're ready to jump in. Next year, in order for students to be passing, they've got to be proficient on all of their learning targets in every content area. And we're going to call proficiency 80%. The risk coalition person who was there at the time said, if you do this, you will have just killed the entire initiative. You're talking about going from a system where a D is passing in every course 
to a system where the equivalent of a B is passing. If you're really serious about this, call proficiency 60%. And they were outraged. 60%, that's so low. How can we say that 60% is proficiency? And he said, that's what you're doing now. Right now, 60% is passing in all of your content areas. The difference is it's an average of 60%. So if you're talking about various learning targets in an art class, let's say, a child doesn't have to master all those learning targets. They just have to average 60% in order to be passing. What I'm saying is if, it's a good, if they're going to have to be proficient, let's call it 60% on all those learning targets. And that just blew people's mind. So that sounds like all we're doing is just lowering the bar. And you're saying that your students are highly prepared when they graduate from high school. Talk about that discrepancy there. Well, our proficiency bar is 80%, but this is something that we've worked on over time. When you're starting out in a system like this, you you have to scaffold it for students, for parents, for teachers, for everybody involved. So in that scaffolding, to get kids to master every learning target is a first step because we don't demand that of our students right now, right? We demand that they average a passing grade. So the first step is understanding that every learning target is important. There was a whole movement about 10 years ago with power standards. You know, there are all these standards, which are the most important. Well, let's power the standards. And I think in this system, you are narrowing it down to say, what are the most critical standards? What are the most critical pieces of learning that every child must master before moving forward? And then going from there. I think what you said there that in the traditional model, we don't demand that they master. We demand that they pass with an average. I think changing us changing our perspective to what you're saying, that we demand that they pass, that they master something is much more powerful because we can actually be assured that they are learning. Whereas, you know, with traditional grading systems, we assume that they learned because they averaged above 60. So they probably got it most of the time. When in reality, that doesn't necessarily ring true. So I really appreciate that approach that you're giving because I, I think that really drives home the purpose and point of doing a standards-based grading system, which allows you to say, anybody who who got a three here, we know they're proficient because they've demonstrated it and not just once, but multiple times. And so I, I appreciate you you bringing that up. And I haven't, I haven't really thought of it that way. So thank you very much for that. I love to use math as an example. You know, on a traditional math test, right, you may be testing multiple things, multiple skills, multiple standards. Maybe you're, maybe it's a unit on fractions. So you're testing, multiplying, dividing, adding, and subtracting of fractions. You get an 80%, you passed. Maybe you got every question about dividing fractions wrong, but you got an 80%. So you're ready for, you're ready for decimals. That's, that's how I like to think of this. You know, I, one of the other things that, that really excited me about coming here was I'm a big fan of the work of Rick Wormley. Are you familiar with, with him? He's a big middle school guru. Yes, absolutely. His whole philosophy of fair fair doesn't mean equal. And he does a whole presentation of you. If you've ever seen it, it's on YouTube on redos and retakes. And it's a great guide to saying if, if this is important, there's no reason not to give kids every opportunity to demonstrate that they got it. And so while his whole thing is about redos and retakes, it aligns perfectly to a mastery-based system where you are going to redo it. You are going to retake this till you know it. Yeah, absolutely. That is a great approach that, you know, we, we so often in education are like, no, they, they have to get it right now on October 15th or else they don't get it at all. And, and really we just want to make sure they get it. That's what we really care about. But we've let this, you know, these grading periods and this time thing, factor in so much that that is what is important, not their actual learning. So I, I love that approach and I'll make sure I put that video in the show notes. I appreciate your, your time today. I have learned a ton personally. It's about time for us to, to finish up. So my last question I ask everybody is what is one thing that someone can do to be a transformative principal like you? I think be present. You know, it's, we spend a lot of time doing 
as principals. We do evaluations. We do school improvement plans. We do timesheets. We do all of those things. But I think being a, a constant presence in the life of the school is, is critical. Being in classrooms, learning next to kids every day. I mean, if you're a principal who's not in at least one classroom or multiple classrooms every day, I don't know that you're doing your job. I think it's being present in meetings with teachers and rolling up your sleeves and doing the work with them. I think it's being present for parents and community members and superiors and giving of your time in, in, in unselfish ways. I was always uncomfortable as a principal with the, with the word boss. Everybody likes to say, hey, boss, what's going on, boss? I didn't think of myself that way. I serve the students. I serve the teachers. I serve the parents. And I think the best way to serve people and to transform the life of a school is to, is to be a constant presence in their lives. Yeah, that's really powerful. Um, I love the idea of being a servant to those that we are working with more than being a boss to those. So thank you for sharing that. People want to learn more about you and about your school. How do we get a hold of you? Easiest thing to do is just go to highlandtech.org. That's our website. You can find me there. All right. That sounds great. Thank you so much again for being on the show today. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I am your host, Jethro Jones, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen I really enjoyed learning from Michael Shapiro, and I hope I get to meet him and visit his school in October. And if I do, I'm sure I'll have more follow-up questions for him. That will be part of this podcast later. If you could take a moment and go to the website, transformativeprinciple.org, and at the bottom of this episode's show notes, there's a little link to answer a question, which is, what are you finding most challenging about your job as a principal right now? If you could take a minute and answer that so that I can help find guests that help you better, I would really love to do that. Thank you so much for listening to Transformative Principle.